would that appeal to me as a policymaker working in the system? And but a whole lot of slogans of what a whole government approach is really cut through all of that. And for you know, I'll say, what does a social movement look like? <laughs> and I said to them, well, what do you think is young people? That's the social movement look like. And it was fascinating when I spoke to these young people. Because the concept that we think is a very um, abstract concept, which is a life course approach, which is intergenerational improvement and well being, is very concretely understood by young people if we just had the time to have a conversation. Because the people I spoke to happened to be in the age group, say 18 to 24. They start, they just have qualified and they're starting their lives as young professionals. And without fail, if you ask those young people why is it that you are successful and they have a bright future, they all point back to the privilege that they had of being born into privilege and being born into a group of parents and families and a wider network that could nurture them when they were young to set them up for life. I don't know how many of you who have kids in the room. And I don't know how many of you have conversation with kids and colleagues or, you know, that is the story of this group of people's circle. That's our story. Um, some of us even can go back and say, there might be some difficult, some of us to remember when we were five years old. But some of us can back and say, we were even from the previous group of privilege and we can stand there and be the best that we could be. So breaking that down for me, and I said to them, you know, my, my challenge to you is the social movement would look like this. Every child deserves what you had. That for me would be what the social movement would be. So if we take that as a point of departure, that's enough for me to show up every day to be a public servant. That's enough for me to show up every day to be a researcher to be somebody working in the NPO, because that is connecting with purpose, that is connecting with need. It's investing in a better future generation. So if I take that as a point of departure, then things are such as understanding the evidence of why the first thousand days is so crucial is then natural. Because I don't have to be convinced to go read the evidence to try and convince me why we should invest in nine months of pregnancy in the first two years of life. If you then go further and you look at the evidence, um, the Lancet Commission, we've been very fortunate in this province to have incredible academics with us. And then understand the evidence that underpins the nurturing care framework. It's a no-brainer. And why nutrition, flanked by educational opportunity, Flanked by safety, flanked by well being, flanked by nurturing and care is crucial for the development of every child that is born into our society. So, with that, Sarik and everybody, Hillary, everyone, uh, wherever we went, and I find I'm in another committee with the top P and people, and people are everywhere. <laughs> but the point is, that was the advocacy for taking a whole of government approach. And Tristan, I know that's where the seeds were, were, were laid. And that's why one of the key um, indicators to track the then, I, I think David had to remind us of a vision inspired priority. And I say, a little bit foggy, the six code, or something like that, called the strategic plan is called the vision inspired priority. I always wondered what the BM is down. But that's why it was one of the six um, indicators that was chosen. Now, I remember the conversation actually, the mother was there, I think so, we might have been there, where we decided how to choose these ones, right? why something was chosen, and why was it read for, what's it, 
being for many and was chosen. Um, and a range of other things were chosen because we were actually applying the life course approach. And we want to galvanize every single government department, every sector of society around investing in children as investment into the future. So I remember all of those contextual issues. But for me, it's really back down to the people that were sampled. And I always say there's a, more than a number on the statistic on the research. Because for every single person of this wider sample inside, there's a story. For every single person that was interviewed, every mother that was interviewed, every child that was interviewed, every child of whose emotions were taken, there is a backstory. There's a lived reality. Every child in that study and every child that was not in the study is more than a statistic in the study. Every child is a human being that is waiting to be developed and to be nurtured into the best version of themselves that they can be. So for me, today marks a very important milestone. It's how accept almost what society, what's with you is we were, we were redirected by COVID. I choose to believe that COVID connected us a little bit better to the purpose of what it is we should be recovering to. So coming out of COVID and doing the survey and doing the results, for me, can mean infinitely more than what it was if we did it in 2019. And that's what the last three years took me, is it gives us an opportunity to do everything differently, to do it more intentionally, to do it more with mindfulness. That every engagement, every milestone like this, has got so much potential and meaning if you take the moment and look at its form. So understanding what the status of state of, of stunting and obesity and the status of nutrition is of children in this province is a very, very important reflecting moment for reflection for the society of the Western Cape. Say, let's, let's take stock. Here's a marker that tells us how well or how not so well we have looked after the basic needs of children in this place. What does it represent to us? An opportunity to change the future. Very few people in their lives can say, I was part, and I know Elmery worked very hard at this point in your retirement, you watch on. But very few people can say, I was really part of when the story was written forward rather than waiting for it to tell it afterwards. Let's use this opportunity to write the story of nurturing and caring for all the children in the Western Cape. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kluta. Thank you for your inspiration, inspirational words and also just setting the scene for us and reminding us exactly why we are here today. So I know that we are all eagerly waiting for the results, I'd like to welcome Professor Maria Senegal to present the results to us. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Dr. Um, and Dr. Harrison and Dr. Kutta, that was those were the exact perfect words that you started with. Um, because um, I think in every document that you read, you will get um, sort of uh, the notion to actually look after children. And, and this sort of been ongoing for many years. And I do think the um, Western Cape has really um, is taking a leadership role really and um, Hillary and I have on a very long road together for 20 years almost. Um, and it was really good to meet Andre with all the enthusiasm. And I think it was really great that they were able to, with the um, help of the various role players, um, get the funding um, for, the, for, the, uh, for the study. So, um, 
I have tried to um, capture the most important um, aspects to make sort of bring across the, 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 the key notions. Um, the report is quite long. We've done many, many analyses. I'm just going to make your mind. Okay. Um, and yes, so um, ultimately one needs to decide um, how much you can say, uh, but um, I am very privileged to be here to be able to um, present the results on behalf of the research group. So I would like to also acknowledge um, the, uh, my, my uh, um, co-primary investigators. Sorry. Um, and then um, the rest of the research Research group, uh, then um, our team leaders, field workers. Um, I've said to them many a time um, without the field workers, there's no research, um, there are no results. Um, they went through a very difficult time. Um, the um, field work coordinator, Sonia, she's sitting at the back there. Um, without her, sort of just uh, doing everything. Right from accommodation to cars to um, everything else, um, you would not have a study. So I do think often, in my view, the, the role of the field worker is maybe underemphasized. Um, and we have the funders and we have the, the researchers, but um, they go, this is a grueling type of study to actually be a field worker on. Um, and they have they personally experienced many difficult circumstances, emotional um, uh, circumstances. So uh, I would like to sort of um, really acknowledge um, the the work. Right. So um, um, diving in the uh, um, um, in the deep end. For me to see actually what's um, on the slide. Um, I don't know whether I move the lectern a bit forward, yeah. would that it's be possible? Sorry. Um, right. okay. That's great, thanks. Um, right, so Andre, um, just to give you a picture um, of sort of what has been going on over the decade. Because it's literally now like from about, about four decades. Um, if you look at the most recent um, on the uh, uh, the update on malnutrition in children under five years old, that's the left hand graph. Um, it's the international um, projection, uh, and the top line is stunting. And you can see I added another data point from uh, 1980. Sort of in the 1970s, if you go back in the history, you will see um, that there was the interest in looking at the nutrition, nutritional status or malnutrition was um, the interest was increasing. Um, and so 1980, you can see almost, almost half of the children in the world seem to be stunted. Um, no, sorry. Okay. Um, and so so we can see that here um, by the 2000s that, that it has gone down quite substantially. Um, and then from the 32% is, it's gone down like to 21%. This is now worldwide. If you look at um, specific regions, um, two regions, some regions in Africa and in Asia, um, it has been going up so um, so it's not um, it's not going as um, um, down as, as we see here, but then at the bottom we can see at the same time, so the double burden, that is very important, and that is why we also felt that it is really important, important to also add obesity, so we have the stunting baseline, but we've added overweight to the baseline so that we can monitor, uh, that can be monitored. I will be very by the next survey, so this is me. And so just to put perspective, and this is a very rough graph um, from the, the national level survey, so it's many little surveys. Um, and I want to caution that um, the, the age groups vary. Um, some include the, the zero to one year old, um, some do, um, are just from one to five, some are um, from one to three and three to six. So, 
with the stream so with, there we go all back to my okay. it is amazing anyways that you can stream it to anyway so it, it, it. some technological issues and it's right so um so and then we can see there seems to be um a little bit of a missing trend i just want to say that um in 2003 um as part of the lancet series um uh, that came out 2008 south africa with that um prevalence was one of the top 20 countries um, in the world in terms of stunting. Um, and we were included in all sorts of um, um, investigations at that point. Um, and then um, the question is now, this is the latest national um, surveys now that, um, that is um, for the total group of zero to under five is about 17%. So it's looking very different from what you see here. So I'm giving you a peek into the, the results there. Then we have um, our overweight and obesity, and we can see what is happening there. But the earliest um, data that we have is from 2003. So overweight and obesity wasn't really monitored um, like uh, the underweight. So the, under, the undernutrition was a big focus, but now we need to understand that um, we actually need to give attention to what is going on there um, at the bottom. Um, right, next slide, please. Okay, this is just another um, illustration of where South Africa is. So we are in the high category, um, not the highest, um, but um, in the high, if we, uh, both for stunting and um, obese, uh, overweight. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Right, um, and so I'm not going to go into detail here, but um, numerous, over the years, numerous, numerous policies and declarations um, and initiatives um, were uh, started to actually address the undernutrition problem. Um, and over time, um, some goals for overweight prevention of um, overweight or reducing overweight also started coming in. Um, and the um, in uh, the second international conference in Rome in 2014, which was sort of quite a, a bit of a landmark. So there were words, words that were used, was used, um, is eradication of this, an eradication of that, which um, if one looks at it really realistically, um, and when in the in the in the eighties it was eradication by the nineties and by um, um, and now we are maybe we can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, the newest, um, the latest. Um, this is now an update of the um, earlier um, goals for 2025. They went, the whole committee went and re-looked really um, the, the goals with a target, bearing in mind actually the concept of the balance between feasibility and aspiration. So the word eradication um, and those things, um, ex you, you, you create particular expectations, but as practitioners, those in the um, actual um, community setting, um, the um, the researchers, etc. We know um, that doing suddenly um, eradicating a problem that has such an overarching origin um, is going to be is is actually unfeasible. And so um, um, I have um, a colleague here at UWC. We've been speaking over the years because I've been in nutrition for more than forty years now. So you see the 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 trends. Um, that you almost come, become a little bit cynical about um, all the hard work that goes into this because it seems like we never achieve the goal. So now they uh, um, Uh, 
So now we're looking at um, stunting a reduction um, of halving it by 2030. So there's a lot of hard work um, that needs to happen. Um, and then the um, overweight um, to go to be less than 3%. Now, if you're looking at a prevalence of um, uh, more than 10%, then that may also even be one we need to look very careful whether that's achievable. Right. Um, and then the breastfeeding, but I'm not going to go through all of them in detail. Um, and this is just a quote um, from that particular um, um, document as the world counts down um, to these um, targets. Um, millions of women, children, and adolescents worldwide, uh, worldwide remain undernourished, even though there seem to be successful um, interventions out there. Um, and political commitment, financial investment, like we've now heard um, from uh, Dr. Kluter, um, that is uh, since 2016, that's been the case here. Um, next slide, please. And so this is where we now come in, and I think the background of the study has been very well um, um, described by Dr. Kluter. So basically, we um, wanted to um, um, profile the, the Malnutrition, um, the malnutrition profile in the in the Western Cape, looking at the stunting, the underweight and wasting that have never been such a um, topic of, of, of um, um, focus. Although these um, severe acute malnutrition SAM has been receiving specific focus, but it, um, if you look at a population level, it is not such a big problem as stunting, and then the growing overweight and obesity is actually more than underweight and wasting. So when we're looking at the secondary aim, we were um, wanting to look at sort of possible drivers, predictors of then stunting and overweight. Not the other two, because these were the main, um, according to literature, the main things and the study that we did in 2018 in the Western Cape, um, that those were actually the biggest um, sort of malnutrition problems to look at. Next slide, please. So um, I um, generated sort of a, a model there on the left hand side, and that I'm taking through the, 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 the whole presentation. On the right, here's a um, so that sort of is a part of the UNICEF model for malnutrition, starting and it's upside down, um, starting with the underlying causes um, and then going to the direct causes. Um, and then we have the socioeconomic insecurity, mother and child care, visitor sanitation and hygiene, um, and then we have the problem. Um, so we, we're missing at the top. Um, the political um, um, and um, community based, although some of the community based aspects come into those reasons. And then the, this is a more um, recent update, the many versions of this UNICEF model. Um, but uh, we sort of use that to um, that, that part of the model for the study. Um, and so the aims. The, the objectives are were to assess each of those streams, and I'll go into a bit more detail in some of the next slide. So I think uh, something that Dr. Kluter um, emphasized is the whole concept of um, uh, uh, sample size, representation, um, and we went about this, or um, our statistician, um, Professor Henry Nell from Stonewash University, um, in a very rigorous way, um, used uh, internationally um, the, the United States Agency for International Development method for constructing a sample. And the two stages um, that are outlined there, and I'm not going to try and explain these equations to you because I wouldn't be able to. Uh, but um, so we have the three um, areas that are typically um, included in demographic surveys, um, what we refer to as um, EA types, enumerator area types, um, urban formal, urban informal, and then usually we have rural. Um, and I'm not going to, um, to explain or just uh, read the definitions of the urban formal and urban informal, but I want to say something about what we have here, which is rural towns. So we um, selected the urban, 
I think in rural EAs. And as we started with the field work, we came to realize that it is actually sort of the traditional urban, uh, rural and deep uh, rural areas are not so typical in the Western Cape. We have large stretches of farmland um, that uh, we actually were struggling to gain access to because of uh, very um, increased security um, measures uh, and there were very few people living on the farms and then we had a, um, a discussion with various stakeholders uh, and decided that um, based on all the um, 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 information and considerations we actually we actually uh, focus on rural towns um, because farm workers migrated to these areas um, and so this is not 100% uh, um, comparable with um, previous studies where we had um, urban, uh, rural areas. Next slide please. Uh, and this just depicts the yellow is then um, the, the, the urban formal um, and um, yeah, I'm just not going to say much more. It just gives you an idea of the spread. So, all next slide, please. Across the Western Cape, and then in the Cape Metropole, we had the most EAs because that's the most densely populated. And this is just, um, I think, this is a good example of the rural town where we have a little town um, with farmlands around it, um, and then urban informal and urban formal. Next slide, please. And the uh, anthropometric measures, um, I'm not going to go into the detail, but we, we used um, internationally accepted um, um, standards for training uh, and doing the measurements and also the interpretation. So the child, um, we, we measured the length, the height, um, length or height and weight and the upper arm circumference and then the primary clearly with the weight and the height. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is again the model. Um, and so the research questionnaire was designed using this conceptual framework. So to the left, we have the socioeconomic um, uh, and food security in the middle, the mother and child care, and on the right, water, sanitation, and hygiene, or which is abbreviated as WASH. Um, and what is unique to the study is that we actually had a very broad range of um, indicators reflecting all of these various um, 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 situation. Uh, and we um, use that to develop a, um, a care index um, and a wash index. So that um, reflects the sanitation or sanitation. We have a care index that reflects all of these indicators that are in the year. Um, were the ones that were linked over other three five that were considered in a um, principal component, uh, iterative principal com component analysis process. Um, and then we have the same here, uh, this is more well known, the wealth index, these studies with wealth index. But then we also, um, and then we, uh, for the prediction, um, just one second, thank you. That's question. For the prediction of, um, Stunting and wasting, um, we actually use the scores then of these indices so that we have an overarching picture of combined um, um, factors that actually contribute. So now you may ask, don't you lose the like of maternal education, which we know is a many research um, studies have shown that that is a, an issue um, or that that's a contributor to mother um, um, insufficiently educated. Um, but now we see that we also want an educated father, um, a father who is working, um, a child who is exposed to the um, uh, learning experiences, um, and all of them combined. I think this is the approach that we've been trying now to achieve here: is to actually be trying, and the recommendations have been um, in that line. But um, I think with this, we have made a unique contribution to this field and unique insight that the teams can take further for their, for their work. Um, the same then for the washing next. Um, and so then all of these 
Next slide, please. Sorry. Um, uh, in the statistical analysis, all I want to um, highlight here, I, uh, Professor Nell, who's got, she's been nine, um, and then we generated um, or, 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 you know, five logistic regression models. Next slide, please. Right, so we have um, the first one here, birth weight. So we had birth weight as a direct cause of undernutrition, uh, of, of malnutrition, sorry. Um, but we first looked, also looked at predictors of birth weight from all of these. Um, then immunization, then diet and breastfeed, uh, um, dietary diversity and breastfeeding, um, although there was nothing significant, no significant predictors for breastfeeding. So we, um, um, I, I'm not including that model. Um, and then um, we actually looked at stunting with all of these and uh, those two and those two and then overweight. So that gives you an idea of how the analysis were done along with the pathways of the model. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and then the ethical approval. Next slide, please. Um, and just a very brief sociodemographic profile of the children here. So we can see how well the age, the year groups were represented in the sample. So, um, and then we had the genders, just about split in the middle, um, <clears throat> race profile, which was very similar to the Western Cape um, um, community-based survey in, in 2016. In Sort of uh, had the need to sort of a representation of a of a problem with the eighth child in the family. Weight prevalence. Um, we can see this is the where there would be a medium public health concern, um, and mostly we are actually being, um, in that in that um, range, except in the all the children specific in rural towns that we found um, the underweight was more pronounced. Next slide, please. Um, then um, the, um, sorry, the waste thing, you can see um, initially in the first year, um, we see more wasting and then um, it really goes down to very low levels. Uh, <clears throat> it is very important to um, be careful when you interpret the results, especially of the younger than six months old, especially when we're looking at, 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 at um, overweight and obesity. But this is something um, to look at. Next slide, please. Okay, and then we have the stunting, and we can see uh, um, that the um, again we in the youngest in the in the it's younger than six months, it seems like the problem is greater. But then here we can see in the end um, in the in the various age groups that it uh, seems like the one to two year and the two to three year olds are the um, most um, susceptible. Um, and so the first thousand days, as Dr. Kluter uh, has said, definitely plays a role there. Next slide, please. Um, right, and now we're looking at the overweight um, and obesity, and here very definitely there's a big warning that a child who is um, falls above the um, um, plus two or plus three um, growth uh, um, BMI for age line um, should not be, be labeled as overweight and obese and put on a weight loss diet. So it's uh, that's really something that needs to be looked at very cautiously. Um, but we can see here again in the <laughs> In, this, in the same age group that we see um, the, the more stunting, we also see the more um, overweight and obesity. The combination of stunting and overweight was only about 3%. Um, so that is not, um, that's in line with what I'm saying. Um, put it into this. Um, and then 
Key, um, key economic indicators, we can see that the dwelling type is mostly formal, the household income, um, quite a, uh, mostly from salaries, um, and then uh, what is important is that 71% of the households had um, at least one grant, um, various grants. And then the um, income, we can see that we um, have not so many in the high, but middle and lower. Um, and the food security, which is also depicted in the, uh, for food in the last month, is almost half. But then the actual hunger um, was one in 10 in the household and um, a child one in 20, which is um, one in 20 too many. Um, next slide, please. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so, um, so if we look at the mothers, um, what is a concern here? Half of them, Lisa and Greta. So we've been talking about the education, and it still seems to be a problem. Um, um, only about um, forty percent employed. Antenatal care, at least one visit looked good. Um, overweight and obesity prominent as we see in the national surveys. Um, and the fathers, a third did, uh, did not have more um, of schooling. And um, just under two thirds were employed. What was quite a concern, um, um, and then also interesting, almost 67% of households actually received a child support grant. Um, and then 82% um, did not um, attend some other form of early um, <laughs> child care um, program. Next. Um, and then when we look at the sanitation, mostly they had pipe water in the dwelling, mostly in their own dwelling or um, in, in the neighbor or in the um, yard. And then the toilet facility, mostly access to a flush toilet. Um, and um, then in their own in their own dwelling, um, yeah. Um, and then hand washing facility. Most seventy five percent had a hand washing facility. In uh, some we couldn't actually see um, or view whether they had one or not. Next slide. Okay. Right now, um, looking at the um, birth rate, we can see here that um, seventeen um, C had a low birth rate. Um, and then if you look at the predictors, we see that the um, household income, the wealth index, um, and then the mother smoking, using alcohol, um, BMI, um, higher BMI, um, and then um, um, lower gestational age. The um, green arrows um, the, um, is for the um, two to five year olds and the, and the blue arrows for the um, younger than two year olds. So we can see that for the first thousand days, um, it's the mother um, who be and who, who, who wait and who, um, uh, yeah, the, the smoking and the alcohol use. Next slide, please. Here we have the immunization status. So we had um, eighty-seven percent who were completely immunized, which I think is a kudo for the um, um, department. Um, and if you look at the predictors for this, um, not ever having been breastfed was a predictor of incomplete immunization. So that can um, reflect care. Then um, ran out of money um, was um, a predictor. This is now for the older children. For, for the um, first thousand days, it was alcohol use and then the mother having a higher BMI. Next slide, please. And here we have um, the breastfeeding where we see initiation is actually very good. Um, and some of the, the children were being breastfed um, up to four or five years, very small number, but you can see actually the duration of those who really breastfeed is quite long. Um, and then um, exclusive breastfeeding, 18.8% in the younger than six months old. Um, yeah, and the complementary feeding from six to eight months um, was 100%. Next slide, please. Um, if we look at uh, the, um, the low diet to diversity, we see that initially in the uh, six to 
two year or uh, 61 year old it seems very undiverse but that um is the nature of um the the, the diet at that point but then it, it uh, improves and you can see then in the older children it gets like 60 percent or so um do not have a diverse diet so it gets worse and this is a really um a very big concern um predictors we can see uh, for the younger ones um a low wealth index and a mother having a higher BMI. It's interesting that this always comes out. And there's been the um, reports on the du dual burden of malnutrition within a house where the mother is obese and the child is undernourished. Um, and then we have um, for the older children, um, the child was hungry and um, the wealth index. Next slide, please. Um, and then the unhealthy food choices, we can see here about a third of the children, um, uh, this is fresh foods. Um, never had yeah, um, fresh foods. So this has never had uh, vegetables. Yes. So this is in the day before the dietary uh, method is in the past 24 hours. But now we can see here the sugar and the salty foods and um, the unhealthy choices and how they got up with age. Um, and this is just a sort of a picture we can see in the in this in zero to six months. Milk is sort of the major. Um, contributor, um, food choice, or the, yeah, the most commonly consumed item. Um, the colors have changed a bit. Um, but then we see the um, cereals starting to come in. And these, um, these red ones um, are the unhealthy ones. So we can see um, that in all age groups, at, at least one or two or three later of the unhealthy choices. Next slide, please. Um, so now finally, the predictors of stunting. Um, let's look at the um, younger children first. So the care index, um, which is very important because this is the first thousand days and we know that this is where the stunting really. And so this is really a very um, insightful result and we really need to look at this. Um, and then we have a low birth weight, which um, we know is a, um, as a, an important predictor for stunting. Um, and then with the older children, it's a um, wealth, low wealth index. Um, and then we go over here, mother smoke, alcohol, drug use. And what is important here is that they remain in the model, although birth weight is in there. So definitely the smoking during pregnancy and so on does have an effect on birth weight and birth weight then has an effect on stunting. But the fact that they remain may reflect um, post-pregnancy um, smoking, alcohol use, etc. Next. Next slide. Overweight obesity. Um, and so here we can see um, for the younger ones, which was also very interesting, um, not ever having been breastfed um, and then having had sugar um, in the past day um, were predictors of overweight. So that whole thing of the breastfeeding and the sugar and tea with sugar in, etc. Um, and then also the BMI of the mother. So a higher BMI, we had a higher um, um, weight. Um, so this is for the, the first thousand days. Um, and then for the uh, older ones, it was just birth weight. That um, So a low birth weight again predicted. A, okay, next slide, please. Almost done. So the conclusion here then, that we have a double burden of malnutrition. Um, the um, planting was close to the upper cut of, of the medium public health um, level of concern, but in the younger than two year olds, it, it gets pushed into high. So although it seems like it's been going down a bit, um, there is still very good reason for concern in the, in, the, in the younger age group. And then the overweight has been pushed into the, um, uh, for the total group, in the very high public health concern, it's just, just gotten there, but um, it is definitely something to note. And that these two are pretty close. It's a 2% um, difference. Um, then, uh, yeah, stunting overweight is not um, um, concern at this stage. And then children in rural um, town um, and urban informal EA types may need to be specifically considered. And then, sorry, just look this up. Um, so, yeah, the question is, will, are we um, on, on road to um, get to these um, 2030 goal to targets? I just want to say that um, in the um, uh, uh, 
Um, uh, provincial Dietary Impact Survey in 2018, where we looked at children from one to nine year old, we had a, um, a prevalence of, um, it, it looks like there's been a decrease in the, um, in, um, the, the stunting from 2018 to um, um, 2022, uh, despite COVID, which is um, encouraging for what is happening here. Right. Okay, so basically the recommendations have been very, um, are very sort of um, compact, if I can put it that way, because um, the, um, there are many things going on, many parties who are playing a role making inputs, NGOs, um, organizations like DG, um, uh, DGMT, the departments, all of these programs, um, and it would be good to actually develop what I call a roadmap of, of what is going on, um, where, who is doing what, et cetera, to take stock. Um, and that's going to be quite a big job to do that. Um, and then from there, look at um, what, what, can, what, what did work, what, what did not work, um, and, um, and then see where, where do you want to emphasize which things do you want to uh, cut? Where do you want to actually put more money? Because um, in the end, um, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, and this, the Western Cape has done, implemented many, many strategies that I know of over the, the 40 years that I've been in nutrition, mostly all, all the time in the Western Cape. Um, and um, I do think this is definitely going to inform um, sort of upscaling some interventions, downscaling others, maybe some new interventions. I do think the uh, substance um, abuse is um, something that we mentioned because it seems to be um, a strong factor. By the way, the um, child grant did not come out as a predictor of anything. Um, next slide, please. And, um, yeah. Um, the important thing um, that I think that um, the group will also need to discuss is the fact that with the focus on preventing and addressing undernutrition, we've now seen the, the upswing in um, overweight and obesity. So the interventions need to be coordinated so that um, you don't inadvertently actually contribute to um, the next problem. And we've seen the swing everywhere. So it's not unique to South Africa. But this one must be very mindful of this. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and these are just a few slides um, which I'm, I'm not going to really talk to because uh, I just want you to, to see uh, and go closely. This was for promotion of breastfeeding. It starts in 1989. And these are all the um, guidelines and declarations and everything else. Um, and I think worldwide, the whole um, 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 promotion of or breastfeeding, which is breastfeeding is still a problem. It's not food. This is sort of um, acute malnutrition. So you can see that comes from the early 2000s. Next slide, please. And obesity, the first one, 2016. All right. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. One, two, one, check. <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Sankar, for those um, results. Very complex, a little bit confusing here and there. <laughs> um, we are now going to move on to a discussion session. I will introduce our panelists and then welcome them to the front. And then after that, I will hand over to Anna Marie for some guiding questions. So, Anna. On our panel today, we have Dr. Hilary Hoyman. She is from the Department of Health and Wellness. We will have Mr. Tristan Gorgans from the Department of the Premier. Mr. Johannes Erasmus from Inera Trust. And Ms. Kenze Hadeli from DGMT. Okay, thanks everybody. I hope the sound is better for the online um, folks. Sorry about all the buzzes and shouts from the mic. Um, and thank you very much. Um, I realized nobody had said yet, or I haven't asked anybody to say thank you very much to UWC for hosting us today. Um,
Um, and thanks for all the tech support, guys. Um, all right, so we're going to start with some um, questions. Um, I'm going to start with Dr. Huimand. Um, did you pass this? I think it needs to be switched on still. So much mention has been made already about the first thousand day project, and you have said so many times you've really loved it in, in all aspects of your life. Um, can you describe to us a little bit more at that project and the interdepartmental elements of that project? That's not worked. Okay, so um, the first thousand days, as you said, is already we know is an interdepartmental um, project, and I think we um, all know that the first thousand days, the period from conception until the child's second birthday, is such an important um, window of opportunity. We also know what you do and you don't do um, in that period affects uh, the trajectory for life. But if we look at what children and families face, the adversities they face, um, it lends itself to a interdepartmental, intersectoral, multi-sectoral um, response um, that is um, required. And I think it was mentioned, made earlier about the nurturing care framework, and it's also well aligned to the Rotel booklet. And it's components that really guides us to say what is needed. Uh, for a child to be um, well um, nurtured. I mean, so all of those elements um, are important. And if you look at that, it is rather complex, but it sits across the spectrum in various um, sectors. And thus, um, you know, sectors need to um, uh, pull um, together uh, to respond. Great. So given that this is an intersectoral problem, then when we've done this piece of research primarily from the Department of Health and Wellness, the next step then is to take the data to your colleagues in other departments. Can you tell us a bit more about what that process may look like and how other departments can use this data set? I'm just going to take a step back to say that, you know, the advantage of working interdepartmentally and multisectorally is that with this data also that we have now is understanding the problem. We now in a position where we can understand the problem, we can take stock in terms of what the drivers are. Um, and in that way, although we've already developed a shared vision um, as a collector, you know, one's able um, to then respond um, also as a collector. There's other advantages in terms of just developing the comprehensive um, holistic interventions that's required, because clearly from what was presented, um, it requires not one single um, intervention, but requires multi-level um, interventions. Um, and I think um, looking at the data, we um, everyone can use it, not only us um, as government, um, the data is rather rich, but I think we shouldn't fool ourselves that it cannot be used at the lowest level, and that's at the level of the community. Um, to create the awareness um, within the community, understanding um, the importance of good growth development and nurture, ultimately um, nurturing care. Um, there's also lots of opportunities for us to use this data now for our forward planning. Um, to have more targeted approaches in uh, certain areas because having an understanding of the differences in, in the different contexts is really important because we know the environment around a child and a family is so important and we've got better understanding now um, having much rich data um, to plan together and I think not leaving communities behind. So, Coming back to whole of government um, approach to our implementation as well as whole of society. Thanks, Dr. Kuiman. Um, next, we have um, Dr. Johannes Erasmus, um, who can offer us a perspective that is really um, rooted in a community in Rockenstein. Um, so, thank you, Johannes. 
Um, so we know that in South Africa and in the Western Cape, there is not yet universal access to quality early childhood development services. But in your context, you are attempting to make that happen, which is a brave process. Um, can you tell us a little bit more? So we know there are multiple components to early childhood development or nurturing care. Can you tell us your approach to nutrition, please? Share some more. Thanks. Thank you, Anne-Marie. <clears throat> I made a PowerPoint presentation, which hopefully will be. I will just do this <laughs> and say my trust is in, in the PAL environment in, in Drakenstein, and we support um, 189 ECDs in the Upper Berg River area, which we call. We implement about 30 projects, but we use nurturing care as an organizing uh, concept for those projects. Of which adequate nutrition is one of those five pillars. And we also do the annual, we do the annual nutritional status assessment every year. Um, and that's one of the projects. And it's the third year that we've been doing it. There has been, and I quickly said, there has been growth in the first year. We trained the mentors, we, and Seba has nine mentors, uh, and they went out and, and uh, measured 67 of those ECDs, the children in those ECDs. The next year we decided we want to broaden the capacity and we train the principals, the 67 principals. This year we train all the 189 principals so that they are able to do it, the capacity, but also interpret the data. Um, so, what I would like to say, yeah, we, we, we so we have five projects. The first one is the nutritional status assessment, where we need to sort of up the capacity of the of the, of the principal uh, to be able to do it, and also to sort of drive the nutrition thing in the ECD within the ECD. The next thing, also with the nutrition status, it, it helps us to understand the need the children to an extent. The second thing is we do kitchen training with the Department of Health. Uh, we've been doing it for a few years because we believe that the people in the ECDs who prepare the food, they are crucial. Uh, their thinking, their behavior is crucial to what ends up on the plate. Third thing, last year we started training principals to, to create their own food garden but also integrate all of the food garden into the day into the day program. The fourth one, initially, we thought that we would develop a referral system because of the, the results of the of the uh, nutritional status. At the moment, we use all health related issues so that the principal of an ECD is able to refer any child in the school that she's concerned about to the Department of Health network. And there's an, uh, an NGO in the Bar area who helps us with this. They do also collaborate, they collaborate with the outside of the bar, and they provide us with 5,000 um, free breakfasts to our children. So, those are the five things we do. sound a little bit things in school and we had a better industry um, is that we have do is to build that surveillance capacity something when we're talking about next steps to really make sure that we build that capacity to all who are in the community so be that community health workers or ecd principals um or people who operate feeding schemes um at community centers that we really build that um nutrition surveillance capacity more broadly so that we don't have to wait five years to know that the problem has shifted, but that we can really tailor our interventions 
um, on a more ongoing basis. So next up, um, Ms. Halebe, who I never call that. <laughs> um, so from the results that Professor Senegal shared, um, something that really stands out is that dietary patterns are not great for very many children. Um, early and then like she mentioned, it gets worse as they grow older. Um, and so this is reflected in the stunting and the overweight burden. So I was wondering if you may share please, some of the steps that we can take to improve access to good nutrition. Thanks, Anna Marie. I think for me, what was so interesting in the results is just really thinking about those interconnections. So I think for me, it's really zooming out and understanding at a system level what are the levers that we can be pulling on to ensure that children do have access to nutritious food. And I think there's a couple of things that we can look at. So I think for me, the first is affordability. I think that's one of the things that we recognize the cost of food in South Africa is rising. Um, we know inflation has had a significant impact on the affordable food basket, which currently I think is standing at approximately 4,900 rand, which in a country with the high level of unemployment that we have, um, we know that that is a significant barrier to individuals, families, and households being able to purchase affordable food. And then I think a significant one, maybe it's linked to what you were talking about, is how do we shift behaviors? I think for me, one of the critical myths or assumptions that we make is that people just know, you know, to where to get the, the food or what nutritious food looks like. And I think for me, we need to nudge and support caregivers and parents around what is nutritious. I think we assume that a lot of people have a lot of savvy around, oh, this is what's unhealthy for my child, or I, I'm very comfortable reading the nutritional information behind um, food, and I know how much, for example, sugar is in bread, for example. So I think there is a lot of education around that, but I think a lot of it also has to be acknowledging that we can't talk about shifting consumer behavior if we don't talk about accessibility. It's not good enough for me to just say to you, purchase these foods because they're really healthy for your child. I need to ensure that in your local community, you do have access to those foods. So when we talk about accessibility, I think for me, it's really thinking about where can I access those foods? Is it at my local supply shop? Is it at my retailer? Is it at the local informal trader who's maybe selling fresh fruits and vegetables that are affordable and accessible? And then I think the last part is really thinking about nurturing local food ecosystems. I think considering the high cost of accessing affordable food, you really need to ensure that individuals in their local context can walk, you know, and access the food that they need to. And I think a part of that is really thinking about innovative interventions, thinking about how do we support local food producers to ensure that they can ensure that you know food is available, excuse me, food is available. Um, and we're supporting entrepreneurial endeavors as well. So I think for me, it's really thinking about it from that systems wide lens. Great, thank you. And I think something else that um, I, I'm not sure, I've spent a lot of time with the data, so maybe I'm sharing something from the report and not from the presentation, but really the, the low levels of children accessing early childhood programs or early learning programs. And so we know that many children who go to a program, there will be a meal provided. But what about the children who don't get to the center? So if we make the feeding scheme attached to the center, the main intervention, we will miss out of children. The child support grant um, reaches an incredible amount of the children in our sample. Um, but there are also children who are excluded from that. For example, children who don't have um, South African citizenship. Um, so there are always children who are at the margins we need to get better access to. And I think what you said about community level access and community econ economic activities around food to make that affordability gap smaller is really important. Um, I don't know if you have anything more to say about um, early child or early learning programs. Um, and the role that they, if we recognize that early learning centers or ECB sites are these opportunities where we can ensure that children do have access to nutrition, then we really think about how do we support them. And I think we've already gotten some signals here at the national government around how they're thinking about nutrition for early learning. But I think for me, it's, it's beyond that. And, and I think it goes to your point around what are the gaps and what are the missing opportunities. 
And I think for me, something that I wanted to share is a project that you actually worked on, um, which is the Masi Creative Hub, which is really working with young people in Masi Kumelele and connecting them into their communities so they're really embedded if they're from the community. And their, their outlook or their mission is to really educate early learning centers, parents, caregivers, vendors, as well as their local clinics around what does nutritious food look like, but also understanding what drives, you know, behavior for me as a parent when I purchase certain goods. And I think for me, there's a real sense of like agency around work like that, where we're really centering the experiences of those who are living in these different contexts to really understand how do we, at a systems and policy level, then shift in order to support them. And I think whether that's with local food producers, because they also have a local food garden. And I think for me, what was really interesting is that they work at multiple levels. So on the one hand, they have a soup kitchen where they're providing meals um, to children who aren't in early learning programs. So I think that's critical as well. So they, they're, they're addressing that gap. But then they're also really thinking about at a policy level, what needs to change, what needs to shift and change in our community. And I think when I see the work that we're doing here, where we have government, we have other um, collaborators and stakeholders that come together um, to really invest in work that's critical is to do that at every level. And I think for me, that's a great example of how possible it is to do that. That's a fantastic segue um, to our next speaker. Um, and I hold it. Yeah. Okay, so um, Tristan, I'm not going to stand on ceremony and call you Mr. Gogan. Um, so we've heard today about um, the conversations that we had many years ago now about elevating stunting as an apex indicator. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you manage an advocacy process to make sure that stunting is on the agenda at such a high level? I think something we've really tried to promote um, in the Western Cape government at a strategic level is to shift our focus from outputs and um, comfortable, uh, achievable targets to, to really thinking about outcomes. And what are the big, um, the big issues, the big hairy issues that really make a difference in people's lives? And stunting, because it's such a complex phenomenon, is the ultimate outcome to tackle. And I think one of the things this, this research challenges us with is that we're now going to need to add obesity to that conversation. We're going to be thinking about Triple burden actually, um, but primarily goes to its outcomes as as um, um, the 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 ultimate um, targets we need to be chasing. Um, but obviously, the challenging thing there is you sign yourself up. You actually need to have the, uh, the um, an organization that is ambidextrous enough to chase multiple um, avenues of trying to address this issue. The Big 3000 Days program is a, is a great example of that, but I think one of the things that we can see coming through the data is that what happens after, after two, and we can see that the stunting, that's where the threat is. It's, it's the gap between two and then um, and five. And we're feeding and we're, we're intervening very well in the first two years, we can see, and government has a clear program as soon as the child enters grade R and into the screening about feeding. But there's a there's a vital gap there that the ECD platform um, interventions in centers and outside uh, are tantalizing the offering us. But I don't think we've stepped into that space yet, particularly at scale. Uh, and that's our next uh, challenge, I think. Great, thank you. That's encouraging to hear. Um, and so in the province, there's also the Nourish to Flourish program. Um, I was wondering for those who aren't familiar with, um, with it, if you could just give us an overview and maybe share how you think this data set can plug into that program. So the Nourish to Flourish um, program has taken a food systems approach to trying to address food and nutrition insecurity. Um, so speaking to many of these interlocking dynamics that we've already heard from the panel, um, but we've decided to focus on, on children and on five quite consciously because we're so worried about the dynamics and the lifelong effects if you get it wrong for, you, for young children. Um, and the focus has been very much on trying to um, initially, as Keith spoke about, get a whole of government approach right. So the start talk about how we start layering um, interventions that think about food and nutrition. And um, so they actually complement each other in space. And so it's, it's very much in line with many other interventions that are emerging in the West Cape government, which is about taking, first of all, an evidence-based approach at a local geographic level, 
being driven by the evidence about what's happening and what kind of responses would be most effective. But then the second element of that is really taking seriously this idea of intergovernmental and then all society approaches that start to uh, address the drivers of those dynamics. So that's really what we're trying to do. Um, of course, food and nutrition, the real, the real conundrum there is that there is no single department that is the convening authority. And so that's something else we're trying to learn through practice is when you don't have one department who has the ultimate responsibility, how do you drive an agenda um, where everybody has to go through? Yeah, that's very interesting. I remember um, 10 years ago when I started being interested in stunting, um, I wrote up the case study of um, what was happening in KwaZulu Natal with the um, poverty war rooms. Um, and I think something similar um, is bubbling from what you're saying here about creating that interdepartmental coordination um, beyond the first thousand days. Um, and so when you read literature about stunting use, often one of the kind of catchphrases is, is it's a risk factor for intergenerational poverty. So a child who is stunted, born of a mother who is probably also stunted, um, who was poor, child is poor because of the, the lifelong effects there are reasons why that child is more likely to remain poor and for that cycle to continue. So could you um, perhaps speak a little bit about the poverty reduction measures and how that may... I think this is this is a, um, a challenge that I think um, is easy to underestimate um, in terms of um, um, thinking about what government's response to poverty and inequality is. And I think one of the things that we've been challenged over the last five years really brought um, into light in a different way through the COVID um, crisis has been how much stress all of our systems, not just in government, but in society, are under. They, everybody is really struggling at the moment. And I think one of the things we've tried to do and quite consciously and quite systematically in the Western Cape government is to start to stabilize some of these systems, to start to do the basics well and consistently and have a quality that actually makes a difference. And I, that sounds um, very unglamorous. It's not, there's no you know, big slogans or innovations um, to be announced there. But I think in the context of shrinking budgets and in the context of growing demand and need in communities, Continuing to do the basics um, well is actually quite ambitious, and we've we've found that. Um, but I think the next step and, and the, the public we're trying to make on the number of programs is the idea that we need to maximize the bang for our buck. That by by not only just doing the basics well, but that, so that the cumulative effect really is to start to shift that intergenerational needle. That's the next um, the next horizon for us. And I think that's uh, we're we'll seeing that on a number of fronts uh, in the programs we chase. Great, thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, we come to the end of the formal part of um, this discussion, and we now open the floor for questions. Um, Mariana, if you don't mind coming to join us here, and then if the panelists don't mind staying um, at the front, and then we can take some questions. Um, it's also going to help you with the mic. Um, so it's a lot to take in. Um, if there are questions from the online participants, we'll try and make them um, come to the front. Um, but yes, questions about methodology, questions about next steps, the floor is open. Almeri. Thank you very much, um, Almeri. Um, and thank you for the kind words from Keith this morning. Um, it is quite a memorable day. And I do think um, what you mentioned was very mindful for us to keep in mind with respect to the, the individuals. Um, it's great stats, it's, it's good presentation, and very clearly the being comes through also of the mother. And I haven't heard much of that in the panel discussion. Obviously, one has to have an in indicator to have many exceptions, and maybe one should implement going forward so that we focus on, you know, all these drivers, 
with, with proper attention. And, and certainly I would like to highlight the fact that, you know, the, the diet of, of caregiver by the father was and child is as critical in your in deliberations going forward and with generations that, that understand that your data that speaks of uh, smoking and drinking and, 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 and substance abuse as intermediary factors under that, 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 that there are symptom, symptomatology of underlying trauma, underlying a disconnect. Uh, we, won't, we won't achieve what we need to. We have got very good models next to me. Um, we were dealing with, with many years with, with Pilani, who showed amazing reductions in these, these data of stunting and, and overweight by supporting mothers in the first thousand days. So, as basic as that, you talk about basic systems, you know, how well can we do our community healthcare workers support for, for pregnant women in the first two, first two years? So, I think it's great start. It's lovely to be invited to see where this is going. I think it's giving us a huge kickstart going forward to do a lot more work. But I would put a plea out that we don't, they don't make the mistake people have done over and over again, and that's just look at the child. The child is in a context. And unless we, we design whatever interventions we take forward um, to look at that, that, that relatedness, and we have got lots of experts, we've got mental health colleagues that can teach us about reflective practice, about supporting parents, about infant mental health, they all just need to be in the room and be part of the way going forward. We as health have got mental health on our, you know, stakes, and we, we need to be doing this very much in mind of the, the psyche that's in the room, not only the body. They are related. Um, thank you for that um, very interesting comment. Um, I just want to uh, mention that we did actually do um, a psychological depression assessment um, using um, the tool that was um, standardized and uh, validated for South Africa in, in all four languages. Um, and they used it in the, um, uh, yeah, the, the Nitzgram um, study, um, and, um, Professor Van der Berg, and then and it was very really interesting for us to see that um, the, the risk for depression was like less than 15 percent. Um, it actually fell out um, in our. Uh, it was included in the development of the uh, care index, but it actually um, fell out. If I can put it that way. Um, and then another question that we included uh, questions was on experience of. Uh, violence, personally, or in the environment, family in the past six months. Um, and it was incredibly low. Um, if you think of what they say, um, if you think um, with the field workers going into areas, we had layer on layer of security in the end to protect our field workers. Um, but then I read a very interesting um, piece uh, of paper where they said that these people have developed such a strong communal um, understanding and support that they, even though these things happen, they seem to be able to, they're resilient, let me put it that way. Not to say that it doesn't need a day, but for us it was extreme, um, sort of very really stressful scenarios. So I just wanted to add that. So there's a lot in the data there that um, you know that you don't see directly reflected on this. So thanks. Yeah, so, so I will I'm trying to to draw from what I saw from the results what that means for policy and implementation. So what I appreciate is what you say is a value add, it's not done in other studies, it's the relation between the EDC and the findings of jail. So I'm interested in, you know, the correlation between the wealth index, the care index, and then the wash index, but more for me, the wealth and the care index. So if you take that as an approach, uh, I, I, from the end of the all the way to Tristan, all of you touch on it instantly. What does this mean in a local context? So, you know, you've got your three scenarios there. So, 
What does it look like in the Google Cloud? So if we go to Bitsenberg and see this, what does that look like? If we go to Mufalain, what does it look like? If we go to Bishop Davis, what does it look like? That's your three type archetypal local context that you're creating. So for me, the first question is, Kristen, I, I hear what you say, but I think we woefully fall short of stepping into a stewardship role as government. Now, it's easy for me to say because from a health perspective, we have no question about the fact that the health and well-being of every citizen in this province is under the stewardship role of the Department of Health and Wellness. So I've got no qualms. So I don't lose sleep about what is my mandate and what my constitutional mandate and what that is. We operate from that basis. I don't believe we necessarily as a whole of government operate from exactly the same time. So if we did, we would not be saying that between the ages of 18 and five-year-old for vulnerable children, that there's no custodian stepping forward. I can't believe, I'm part of government, I can't believe that there's no custodian. So having said that, the thing that's very useful for, for, for the frame, and I'm challenging the, 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 the panel, um, if you bring those three indices together and you look at the outer manifestation, which is stunting and malnutrition, and we said the others maybe not that significant, but if you bring that together, what does it mean? And I know you try to use the old. Unity framework. The thing is, much more proximal to me because I'm also co chairing currently a mental well being initiative. I'm also co chairing safety initiative. The social ecological framework makes a lot of sense, right? So going from um, um, obesity. And then these proximal behaviors. So the first thing you started saying is these are the behaviors. So it's the choices. And it's about the agency of the caregivers or the household. I don't think any mother or any caregiver gets up in the morning and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna starve my child. I don't think anybody sets up with the intention of saying, I will create an obese child or I create a, a stunted child. So there's something, like you say, the resilience is there. I would have to believe that the custodian of somebody in the household has got the best interest of the child at home. What is the structural factors that influences that person's agency to make the right choices? So unless we use this opportunity, we will be skirting around the agency. And that's where the boldness has to come forward, in my opinion. It's really about understanding what influences agents and choices. And then you can't get away from the fact that those things are linked to your three indices. It's linked to your wealth index and it's linked to your care index. A little bit to your hygiene and sanitation index, but it's linked to the context where you find yourself. It's your environment, it's your, let's call it, your educational attainment of how maybe a system has failed to influence what your education attainment is. And then lastly, it's linked to your wealth, it's your income, your household income. So, so just a, there is evidence across the world of how to actually turn that around. Whether we have the political will, whether we have the government will to actually step into that space, that's what's called for. It's bold, bold action. So it means that we need to go in and pull the regulatory figures on, or regulatory leaders, on unscrupulous providers of non nutritionist foods, then we must do so. Who does it? Who goes in? Who regulates what happens to it? If it means that we say we're sitting in the Western Cape and there's a whole lot of fruit being used in but it's not accessible to somebody in a small town, which is right next to the farm where it happens, and it's right into the township where it never reaches, but a lot of that food gets gets up. Who's responsible for that? Who steps into that to take a certain control on those? So there's some, I mean. You know, I've always reminded that somebody did some research in the West and I think it took a little bit different than elsewhere. Actually, we should be doing much better with the resources we have. We should be doing much better with the, the natural resources, the ability, the capabilities we have at our, our disposal. Are we brave enough to take the systems approach? Okay, it's nice to say systems, but are we brave enough to go system wide? Are we brave enough to go system B? 
What does it mean for that person whose choices are compromised by their values? That's what it's all about. So I, I'm, you know, I believe in myself as a public servant, I do believe that this is a cause that's worthy that everyone should be willing to say, for the next generation, we invest, we do whatever we need to do. And we call to responsibility whoever needs to call to responsibility to look after their own decision. It's a bit of an activist, Kaga directed to this in our interview, but Kaga and the panel say that this is a challenge for us to step into. Thanks. <laughs> Um, my hand was that in terms of the washing basic action was very interesting that it was not a predictor of anything yeah. in the end. Um, but if you look at the, the profile, um, the water, the sanitation, um, and the hygiene seem to be in place mostly, which was also sort of surprising. Um, and it was very much in line with what was found in the 2016 community health survey. So that seems to be that's the basics of this thing. Um, and then we also looked at um household level indicators, just something completely more um sort of outside the, the water was looking at the, uh, the, the floor of the floor. So this was a um, um, subjective observation um, by the field worker and the cleanliness of the child's clothes. That were they were that was actually in the index, they were retained there. Um or they ended up being we got a good effect rate. Um and they were very good. Um so irrespective of the circumstances, um there were differences between the uh, the EA parts. Um and so it's again that resilience. So yeah, just to add to that the wash concept. Great. Um, we do have one question online, which I'll just read out and then we'll go back to the floor. Um, it's from Lizandra Kasi at Stanabosh University. Um, she says, Almarie may have alluded to this, but the sound is a bit erratic. So apologies if there's any repeat here. Um, on face value, so many predictors point to the mother's behavior, smoking, alcohol, drugs, overweight, employment, education, and the interventions tend to start and stop there. This may, may be less of a reflection of the mother, but rather the environment surrounding the mother, influencing maternal, mental, and other aspects of health, which um, is expressed eventually in the predictors. We should obviously address the behaviors, but we should stop stopping there. The focus should probably be on the determinants and the drivers of the identified predictors, which I think speak directly to what you just said. So, next, uh, so this, this is more of a statement, um, and I think there's a lot of um, agreement in the room, um, just for those who can't see the audience. Sorry, can I just add to that? That, that is sort of what we try to um, accomplish with the care index, is to go beyond the mother um, and what is around the mother in terms of the father and the situation uh, there. Um, and then also the child's education um, access. So those all, um, Sort of represent, they're represented there. So I do think if one looks at the results very carefully, you will find those um, other um, beyond the mother, if not put that way. But if the mother is smoking and drinking during pregnancy, that, that has to be a, a priority. Thanks. Um, Hi. Oh, sorry. Do you mind just introducing yourself yes. for the online no, I am Tandi Vessels. I'm a district pediatrician in Metro East. And I work with Mary and them on the first thousand ladies um, group. Uh, but thanks, this is really interesting um, information and data. Um, I just have a few questions. Um, the first one is um, how do we see this going forward, or how are we taking this forward involving other sectors, for example, um, with programs that help and other sectors are already working together, for example. Um, the family strengthening programs, parenting program, which, will, which is also something that we are looking at to address um, violence prevention and programs like dreams, which is in the schools, targeting youth. Um, so we are, that help is involved with other sectors where we could utilize this data or add to what they are delivering. 
So just the question around that. Um, and then the second one, I mean, we all find it quite, uh, uh, well, it's not surprising, but we all know, and from the data, it was, it was really sad to see that, I mean, about 40% of the households earn less than 3,200 rand per month. Um, and even that middle group, which is 4,000 to 25,000, we know that's probably not enough. If a food basket costs 5,000, um, even that group will suffer. So um, how can we use this data for advocacy? Um, perhaps the child support grant actually needs to be increased because it does not even touch sides in terms of like food, the food poverty line. Um, and yeah, um, there are many other things like the basic income grant, which I think but that is not necessary for this audience. But I think we should use this data um, for that. And then just the last, question is just around um, the depression scale. So I find that quite interesting that um, those numbers are so low. And I wonder if it has got to do with the context in which it was asked, um, or perhaps the, um, yeah, I just, I, I do find it quite interesting because, yeah, uh, thanks. Surprise. Um, can we start with the last question yeah. about the depression score and then I'll hand over to Hilary to respond to the other questions. Um, I agree with you um, um, that, 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 that the, the, um, the premise was low, but the, 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 um, the field workers were well trained. Um, quite a number of them have been working on the issues because these are sets of questions on the issues of the um, you know, gender-based gender violence so, um, so they were, and we discussed them. And, and so, yes, we we have to, and then, I mean, this is so full of surprising because I checked like about how to check myself. Um, and you see these, um, these questions coming through and you, and you just see happy, happy, happy most of all the time, and you just can't agree with it because um, of the circumstances. So, um, yeah, so I, th this is the outcome, and, and um, what can definitely um, always be to any self reported information you need to consider carefully, but because it's such a huge sample, um, it does sort of um, indicate that for some other reason, and I do think this resilience thing. Is something that we cannot uh, need to sort of even consider. I just want to make a point about the, the grant, the child grant, um, and that type of intervention. Um, and it, it comes over all the years and all the various phases of interventions of giving food and giving this and giving a porridge and so on, is the dilution effect. So increasing the child grant. So I think that is something, uh, I think it's a bit of uh, a headache for, for all the time that I have every intervention sort of phase where you give something to the family. Um, you know, so that is why in the early child care to actually have a meal there or have it really child specific and maybe looking more into that than adding to what is given to the family. But I mean, that is just sort of a perspective that I would give. I think Tanya to respond to the question in terms of how do we take it forward is to continue uh, the conversations um, and continue the conversations we start to translate um, this thinking um, that we have and also we'll be working with Tristan and the team is to put different panels together where we then unpack and look at the predictors and then reconvene probably in two months time after we've unpacked and looked at how this can be translated um, into practice. With that saying that I think there's a lot of work um, ongoing in the advocacy space, um, looking at the issues of birth registration, child support grant, and even looking at support for uh, pregnant mothers because we know the grant only kicks in, um, you know, for, for children. So I think those conversations will also continue um, with different groups. So in essence, I'm also saying that the response can definitely 
not be only through health that we would need to work as a as a collector. So then Tristan, if you want me to add. While well, the mic is going past me, sorry, I'm gonna grab it. Um, just about the predictors, I just want to explain about the stats. So when you have a say education and you have stunting outcome, you can look at how they how well they are associated, and you did say there's a significant association. Um, that's the first thing. What we uh, the results that have been reported um, are um, the multiple regression. So throwing everything in a bucket, um, and then what comes out. So it's a very strong association. Um, one of the ones that were maybe um, significant, uh, um, sort of in your bivariate um, analysis, um, that, that some of, a lot of them may fall away. Um, so what we have is really, they're not that many, but we need to look at them carefully. Thank you. Um, we're going to take one last question from the floor. Apologies to those online, and then we're going to the next step. Sorry, we have to respect everybody's time. Tristan, do you have a comment? Um, so uh, just to say in terms of the way forward, we, we um, really want to start to um, test um, the different lenses that can be applied to the single um, set of data so that we really understand um, the diversity of practices that could be informed by this. So we, we're going to try and think quite carefully about how we do that as Elmarie already indicates. It, thinking from, through a mother's lens or a caregiver lens might be one way. Thinking maybe through the different petals of the nurturing care framework. We, we need to think really about the best way to divide this up so that we can be very focused about getting to practical education the so what question that's hidden in the data i think there's all layers there's so many layers of it um so that's that's something we're going to do as a small team maybe and then um hopefully as Hillary said we work towards either a single big event where different um sets of findings are presented or a series of panels or a series of events where we bring together the experts on particular issues and we start to unpack um, we haven't quite got there yet, but I think it's certainly on. That's the next step is, is to figure that out and then start doing that and doing it soon so that the data is still um, fresh. Um, I think that's okay. Today. Thanks, Tristan. Um, we're going to take our final question. Is it from? Oh, thank you. Um, I, uh, Yaku Lo from Foundation for Alcohol Related Research. You can guess where my bias lies. Um, we do a lot of harm reduction uh, with pregnant women, but in a specific project that we did, we did uh, ECD intervention. We actually got funding from the Innovation Edge to deliver a tablet-based ECD intervention. Now, the findings I want to mention from there is twofold. First of all, recruitment was too easy because we had about 50% of women that we interviewed that admitted to clinical levels of alcohol use during pregnancy. So we know that that has a big influence on stunting. Secondly, we did uh, neurodevelopmental assessments and children not exposed to alcohol performed as poorly as children who were exposed to alcohol, which you would expect would not be the case. And these are children recruited from ECD sector, which is the concerning factor. But my final question about it is that we know the intersect with uh, with executive function and neurodevelopmental assessments and things like that, and toxic stress in childhood. So my question about the indicators was, you did look at the resilience of the mothers, but was there any questions about toxic stress amongst children, corporal punishment, uh, exposure to uh, violence, and that kind of question? Thank you. Um, no, we did not go into sort of the child level detail. It was um, asked um, uh, the sort of exposure to violence, et cetera, et cetera, was um, anybody in the family. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's a, um, a very sort of further advanced question, if I can put it that way, why that happens. Um, one of the, um, um, uh, the research that I'm involved with is uh, folate supplementation, it's an ongoing. Um, you may know uh, uh, the studies um, in um, um, women using alcohol during the pregnancy. Um, and so that is something, um, I mean, um, you want, firstly, for women not to drink alcohol, but um, to actually reduce the 
um, the FSAB and, and all those. So um, it's those are all aspects that I think that we get a lot of um, um, the dimensional sort of um, looking at all of this and bringing in all of those points. Thanks everybody for the panel discussion. I'll hand back to you. So, and sorry for those online that we didn't manage to reach your questions. Thank you so much, Anna Marie. Thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you for such a rich discussion. I certainly enjoyed myself. We are now at the end of our engagement. So I would like to hand over to Dr. Harrison to close off this engagement for us. Thanks very much. And it's um, it's it's been a fantastic collaboration. So thank you to the Western Cape Department of Health and Wellness, uh, to, uh, to the research team, um, to the DGMT team uh, and to um, uh, all of the community workers and others who are involved. Um, I really do think that um, it represents the type of collaboration that this country needs. Um, we have a limited amount of expertise that sits across a variety of sectors. We have to find ways to work together um, if we are going to create uh, the, the sort of leapfrogs that synergy can bring about in a, in a resource-constrained environment. I want to make a couple of points. Um, if you want your economy to grow well, your children have to grow well. Now, why is that the best kept secret in the country? Okay, why is it that why is it that the economists don't know? Why is it that when we talk about economic growth in this country, um, uh, issues around child nutrition don't feature at all? And and I I think I think we've got to take that seriously. It's our problem. It's our problem. Why are we keeping that secret? Why why is this room not full of economists? Why is it full of why is it uh, uh, only full of health people? Um, and 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 let's understand um, if children are, uh, are chronically malnourished, their brains don't develop well. If their brains don't develop well, they can't learn at school. If they can't learn at school, they drop out from school or they fail. They 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 become unemployed or they get into low paid jobs and our country only has a 16% skilled uh, a skilled uh, pool in, in the labor market um, and, and that's why this country is falling behind that's why when you have a look at economic growth over the last 40 years our average GDP per capita growth real is 0.7% that's lower than any other that's lower if you look at the, uh, the trends it's lower than any other region across the world and, and if you look at if, if you look at countries of similar economic growth to to South Africa, South Africa has got the highest stunting rate compared to to any of those countries. We've got so far; we can't get any further. We're stuck. We have no way of um, of, of further developing and contributing to a knowledge economy. And we know from we know from uh, developing countries, we know from the analysis that half of the total factor productivity growth. In other words, that just, those factors that are driving economic growth that are not just capital and labor, we know that 50% of it in developing countries is still development, 50%. And if we have a look at the human capital index of the, of the World Bank, we see that the two biggest drivers of South Africa's low ranking, 78 out of 130 countries, and the reason why only 43% of the, the potential human capital that could be developed by children born today will be attained by the time they're 18, only 43%, is due to two reasons. One, a high stunting rate. Two, the fact that our discounted years of, of, of a successful education is 5.6, even though our children are at school for 10.2. And we know that's due to poor, poor teaching, but we also know that is due to inability to learn. So, so the case is strong. I know everybody says that their special, uh, their, their special case is what we must get behind to drive economic growth. I, th I think if you have a look at it, if you have a look at the relationship between stunting and learning and education and economic productivity, it's very difficult to find to find a stronger case. So we have to, as as um, as Keith said, we have to actually now get above the parapets. We've got to we've got to take this to another level. We've got to take it with a boldness and an assertiveness that we've not had before. We
We can't say that we haven't done well over the last 40 years, therefore we're going to carry on doing the same things. I want to say just a couple of uh, points in conclusion, just my reflections on what have been said today. Firstly, um, we must be careful that we don't separate our stunting uh, from overweight. It's the same problem. I, I may have heard it, uh, but, but I think, Marianne, I think you said that low birth weight is one of the strong predictors of overweight, of obesity, of, of, of obesity. And, and, and that's consistent with many, many other studies since the Dutch famine in the Second World War, showing that children who are chronically starved in utero, um, they, 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 the epigenetics just switches over so that they start to grab as much food as they can and they end up, they, 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 they end up being obese. I'm simplifying it. Obviously, there are many other factors. But I think as we deal with this issue, let's not say, oh, wait a minute. You know, stunting is coming down, but no, we must worry about obesity. We have a demographic transition, we have a nutrition transition, and we need to understand and grasp and deal with it uh, together. Food choices, and keep uh, you touched on this. Um, prices distort food choices. Okay, we know that. I can send you the, the studies. So, so people don't have choice. Um, you can see it. Go to your, your local Woolworths, those of you who should. should Shop at Woolworths. The place is full of beautiful salads. I, I, I mean, it, it's it's incredible how full it is. Go to your shop right and see how small the veg, uh, vegetable and fruit and fruit section is. Okay. Now we, we we need to understand it. We need to understand that food affordability drives people to substitute um, proteins with carbohydrates. Okay. We've got to do something about that. That's our fundamental problem. It's not just about how high the children are. It's about the nature of the food that, um, that they are getting. Um, child support grant. Child support grant only provides 70% of the, the total nutritional need of a child. We've got a 30% food gap. Well, we say people can fill that, okay, but, but they don't. Why? Because we've got a 25% Stunting problem across the country and, and a little bit lower here. And, and if you add the fact that those children need cooking oil um, to, to cook the food and a bit of clothes and that is and all the rest of it, we've got a 50% food gap. So we have a real issue here that our children are not getting enough food. And th this, this is really the point that, that, uh, that uh, where, where I want to start here. That there cannot be nutrition security without food security. Okay, that is the starting point. So, so we've got to be careful that we don't get so bogged down in all of the socioeconomic indicators that we lose track of the fact that we have to ensure that children have sufficient food, okay, which, which we know is not going to solve the stunting problem because uh, other factors like our real disease and, and housing and, and, and maternal uh, considerations come in, but it is the starting point. It is a necessary condition. Or to achieve nutrition security. So I would like to challenge you not to get bogged down in too many meetings, not to get bogged down in too much process. You know the stuff, you know the provinces. We've heard, we've heard the specifics at the local level. You guys know what is going on. And I'd like to suggest that there are a few things that you have to focus on now. The first is for is food affordability. You have to. I put a proposal to Treasury, to Nedlac and others in the last couple of weeks, uh, and to industry, and said, how about this? We, let's identify the 10 best nutritional buys. Okay, dry foods, let's just identify that. And ask Treasury to, uh, sorry, ask industry to waive their markup, the manufacturers and the retailers, waive their markup. We know that markup's fairly small already on those on both of those products. Waive their markup, and Treasury, National Treasury, you match that uh, that forfeited markup. Okay, we can double it. We can get a 20 or 30% reduction in the cost of that of, of, of that basket of food. And then we must come in behind. We must promote that basket of, of food so that people start, uh, uh, start to promote it. It's not the whole solution, but we need to be thinking differently because we know that government simply doesn't have another 225 rand to add to the child support grant. It's going to have to come from industry. It's going to have to come from others. We need to be thinking creatively about that. Um, do you know that Lusaka, which used to be called Net One, uh, which um, was the uh, which was the entity responsible for um, for social security, um, is allowed still allowed today to um, lend money to poor people. 
um, using the child support grant as guarantees. Okay, so so people are are, are desperate. Okay? They are they are they are borrowing money, and they are paying it to this lender at, at high fees because they can't pay, pay back. I'm not surprised that child support grant didn't emerge as a positive. Uh, as, as for two reasons. One, as I said, is only 70%. It's not enough. But secondly, this is the type of stuff that's going on. And Keith, if there are ways to intervene, if we seriously try to say this is the type of iniquitous practice that has to stop now. So food affordability is number one. If your, if your low birth weight is truly 17.1%, that's very high. That's very high. Why is it so high? The national is 14.1, 8 at the moment. Why, why is it so high? It's unusually high. Um, and, and I think we need to understand that. Is it, is it due to uh, high rates of alcohol in this, uh, in this province? Is there other stuff going on? But I would completely agree that we've got to focus on pregnancy. We've got to, we've got to look at this package of supporting pregnancy. Um, uh, and we also need to look at what, what we do in the first six months after children are born who are low birth weight. You know, in India, they had a strategy of, of, of intensive support for uh, in the first six months of the low birth weight and saw a dramatic improvement. We know that without that, it's your low birth weight kids that are, are going to end up as the permanently stunted uh, children. And then finally, this province has done the most um, in terms of taking alcohol arms reduction seriously. The Premier's office is involved in it, the fantastic white paper. Now we're going to get it over the line. Um, I really would appeal to all of you to ensure that the Premier doesn't fail at the, the final line, that, that the presence from industry are not so much that in fact the Premier and the Premier's office backs down. It's absolutely critical if we're going to address malnutrition in the Western Cape that we get in place um, those strategies for alcohol harms reduction. Um, um, uh, regulating training hours, uh, hopefully introducing some sort of pricing strategies. These are the things that are critical. My last point is this. We don't have a choice. Constitutionally, the right to, to nutrition for, to, for children is embedded in the Constitution. It's not subject to, it's not subject to progressive realization. It's an absolute. We, we've seen from this survey that uh, the rates have come down, but still, we are violating the rights, the, the rights of one in five children in the Western Cape. Can't be tolerated. We have to do something together. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, those online, thank you for staying a few minutes extra. And thank you again to all our in-person um, attendees. Getzo, would you like to say the last words? All right, so I have the opportunity to say the last words. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you so much.